Hello and welcome to this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. I'm your host, Leah Razan, the online editor for Bioprocess International. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This webcast is being recorded and will be made available for replay in the multimedia section of our website. We've muted the audio lines, but we welcome you to type in your questions for our speaker in the chat window on your screen. After the presentation, we will begin the question and answer portion, and I will ask our speaker your questions from the chat window. Your questions in the chat window will only be visible to myself and our speaker. So thank you for joining us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Campbell Bunce from Abdina. Thank you for the introduction, and welcome to this webcast on developability, evaluating specificity, immunogenicity, functionality, and manufacturability for lead candidate selection. Uh, subtitled, Selecting the Best Product Candidate for Manufacture and Clinical Evaluation. My name is Campbell Bunce, and I am the Chief Scientific Officer at Abdina. We are a global service provider supporting drug development from concept or idea to GMP manufacture. In this short webinar, I will talk about what we mean by developability, why it's important, and how we go about it at Abdina. So developability um, is a relatively new word that we hear being used more and more in the context of, of drug development. Um, but while it's a new word, it, it is an old concept. Essentially, it boils down to, to two key questions. Can we make it, i.e., can we make it to the required scale and the appropriate form and at a suitable cost? And does it work? Uh, does the drug do what we want it to do with an appropriate safety parameters? We all know and are aware of the, the very high attrition rate in drug development. Uh, many of our uh, drug candidates fail between discovery and clinical proof of concept, uh, the so-called valley of death. But addressing these questions early in the development process can have an enormous impact on the success of drug development. So there are a number of stakeholders in, in um, uh, or who are or should be interested in the, the value of developability assessment. Uh, and these include uh, drug developers um, interested in managing risk early in the development process and minimizing downstream costs, regulatory agencies uh, who need to be satisfied that we know enough about our drug before taking it into patients, investors who would like to have some confidence that they will get a return for their investment, and not least patients uh, who expect to be given something that has the best chance of treating their disease. At Abzina, we apply an integrated approach to, to drug development, uh, tailored to the type of drug candidate that we are developing. And we support development from discovery and design through lead selection optimization and into GMP manufacture. And we cover large molecules in the form of recombinant anti uh, antibodies and recombinant proteins, small molecules in the form of complex synthetic compounds, and the combination of these for bioconjugate drug design and the development. And this extensive range of expertise and capabilities allows us to develop a broad range of drug types and designs. And the complexity of some of the, the new and emerging therapeutics uh, really emphasizes the importance of developability assessment. So what do we mean by developability assessment? Well, in essence, this is a series of in silico computational methods and models, analytics and in vitro uh, and ex vivo experiments designed to characterize and select a lead drug candidate, which is the greatest chance of clinical success. And we do this uh, for a number of reasons, and this is really to identify liabilities and risk factors in drug candidates very early in the, in the process, um, so that we have the opportunity to, um, uh, or the opportunity in the scope to apply design alterations to fix and reduce these liabilities. And being able to reduce these uh, early on gives us a chance to obviously reduce the likelihood of major issues arising at later, more costly stages of development. Uh, manufacturing and clinical evaluation are very costly, so we want to make sure that we've minimized any issues arising during those stages. 
And ultimately, we are looking to select uh, the best candidate to take forward into development. And this process can start um, at the, the uh, very early stage from discovery through lead selection and optimization. So at Zena, we evaluate uh, a number of key attributes um, uh, as part of the developability assessment. And these are aligned to the target product profile that we want to achieve. So we look at specificity, uh, binding of the target, uh, and cross-reactivity to other species. We look at functionality, uh, including intrinsic uh, and extrinsic or added on activity through bioconjugation. Uh, we look at immunogenicity and safety. Uh, and manufacturability, so include uh, stability and buffer parameters. So these cover the, the can we make it uh, and does it work questions with some elements of safety evaluation. And we don't look at these uh, attributes in isolation, but we apply a holistic approach and look at the different um, attributes together. So this avoids, for example, building something that might have an excellent functional um, profile but is not stable or can't be manufactured. While this is a cartoon of, of an antibody, we apply the same approach to fusion proteins, recombinant proteins, and, and bioconjugates. So our approach is to apply a complementary uh, set of methodologies at each of the different stages of discovery and development pathway. So early on, um, we look at in silico uh, and some high throughput uh, methods um, uh, to, to help screen uh, with sort of minimal cost. And then we apply physical and functional assessments as we go through the selection and optimization phases. And obviously throughout the process, we are looking to identify liabilities uh, to apply mitigating and correctional strategies. So for example, identifying emergency risk and designing this out of the sequence. Now this may add some time on to the, to the front end of our timelines, but this reduces the longer term risk uh, if issues are unearthed later in development when they're much more costly to fix and take much longer to fix uh, as well. So all the while we're reducing the number of drug candidates as we go through this attrition process, and by the time we get to uh, stage four, we have a comprehensive understanding of a single or a couple of candidates to take to cell line development and manufacture. So this slide illustrates the extensive range of analysis that can be done at each stage uh, of development. We would not necessarily do all of these, but work on standard or flexible developability work packages, depending on the nature of the therapeutic and the stage of development. With the very novel emerging therapeutics that are coming through, we also adapt and develop new assays to suit. For the rest of our time, I'd like to pick out in a bit more detail some of the things that we can do for each of the four key attributes. So we utilize the great breadth and depth of our bioassay bio and analytical ex expertise to evaluate specificity uh, and functional activity. Multiple methods can be used to evaluate specificity through, through um, binding, you know, so BioCore, Octet, and ELISA. SPR using BioCore is a particularly valuable method that we apply. And we use single cycle um, analysis for high throughput um, affinity assessment for initial screening on high numbers of variants. We then use multi-cycle analysis on shortlisted candidates to get a more detailed assessment of affinity and, and on and off rate. Uh, when we're looking at uh, IgG or antibodies and IgG fusion proteins, um, FC uh, receptor binding is an important uh, characteristic that we evaluate. We also use BioCore to do this from a binding perspective, looking at FCRN and the different um, FC gamma receptors uh, in terms of binding properties. And we also have a large number of functional assays to measure things like complement um, fixation and activation. ADCC uh, and phagocytic induced uh, activity. We have an array of functional assays that can be utilized to monitor a um, diverse range of modalities. <clears throat> These can be used to rank potency between variants and compare against known or competing therapeutics. 
And while bioassays can be complex, we endeavor to develop assays that are simple, robust, and, and, and very reliable to increase our confidence in the data that we get. And also with a view that some of these assays may be um, qualified for release testing um, on the potency front. Some of the assays are, are off the shelf. Um, so for some of the more common targeting mechanisms like checkpoint activity, uh, we've already got um, predefined assays that we can plug candidates into. Uh, but in many cases, especially for the emerging therapeutics, bespoke assays um, uh, or tailored assays are developed around the novel and oftentimes multi-component modes of actions of these. For biologics, evaluating immunogenicity risk is very important. Immunogenicity is driven by a number of factors, including presence of T cell epitopes within the primary amino acid sequence. Aggregates uh, and excipients and formulations can also, um, can also uh, present an immunogenicity risk. So we have a broad range of tools and assays to evaluate uh, immunogenicity. And we apply at the early stage an in silico bioinformatics process that allows for rapid and early screening for initial immunogenicity risk profiling. Ex vivo assays allow us to rank candidates based on induction of CD4 T cell responses from a broad population of human peripheral blood mononuclear cells. At the optimization stage, we can deploy ex vivo assays such as T cell epitope mapping um, or proteomics. Uh, and these assays can precisely define sequences that are presented in the context of MHC molecules and whether they contain putative T cell epitopes. Ex vivo assays can also be used to assess whether aggregation or formulation excipients may increase the risk of immunogenicity through unveiling of cryptic T cell epitopes. Manufacturing uh, liabilities can be identified also early on through in silico processes. Um, so we can uh, identify, for example, deamidation or oxidation uh, risks within the binding site of our candidates, um, or on expression and production of small amounts of material. We can look at multiple physical chemical parameters, uh, including post-translational modifications, aggregation, fragments, and product-related impurities. We can down-select through pre-formulation assessment um, and stability studies and work up suitable formulation parameters that relate to the target product profile. And it's important to have a good idea early on what the expected route of administration um, and anticipated dose ranges to be tested in the clinic are, as this helps define and address the appropriate sort of target product profile parameters that we would assess during this uh, manufacturing stability stage. So by way of uh, working example, uh, this is our typical antibody humanization workflow. So from the hybridoma uh, sequence, we can apply um, structure and homology modeling to identify uh, critical residues for binding. And you know, these can uh, be mapped onto, the, onto the, the, the humanization design to ensure that we maintain the binding affinity. In this case, we are humanizing with our proprietary composite human antibody technology, not the basic CDR grafting. But we do and can apply CDR grafting um, uh, if, if, if the developers want that. So this uh, design stage, we run these sequences through an in silico liability avoidance filter to identify any regions that carry stability or immunogenicity risks. And we can use this information to design out these liabilities through appropriate amino acid substitutions. We can then clone uh, and express multiple design variants in small quantities to establish binding affinity as an initial um, screen. And then select a short list of five or so variants to make more material for. So with more material, we can apply a more comprehensive developability assessment, including immunogenicity and spontaneous immune activation analysis, in particular for um, uh, products that have an immune modulating activity. Uh, we can look at affinity and specific specificity characterization. 
functionality uh, testing, and an array of manufacturability parameters. Of course, the outcome here is um, the selection of the best one or two candidates to progress through to cell line development. Now, I haven't included uh, what we do through cell line development and developability because I didn't have time to do that in the 15 minute um, time frame. Um, but there's uh, multiple things that we can do within cell line development for a shortlisted one or two candidates. Through stable pools, we can create more material for formulation development for extensive stability studies and take that into mini bioreactors as well to establish how the product or the cell line performs in terms of productivity. So in summary then, uh, there's very high efficient rates of drugs in discovery and development, uh, with only a very small fraction of these getting uh, to pivotal clinical studies and onto the market. This can be mitigated by adopting a developability plan early during design, lead selection, and optimization stages. And we can create the predefined or tailored uh, developability work packages that can be applied to assess a number of the key attributes, including specificity, functionality, immunogenicity and safety, and manufacturability. So the more we understand about your drug candidate, the earlier in the process, the better chance we have to address issues and significantly increase the likelihood of success. So I'm going to stop there and thank you very much for listening. Um, and I'm hoping I've got one or two minutes to address any questions that you might have. Okay, great. Thanks, Campbell. So we do have um, a couple questions. Is there a database of immunogenicity of monoclonal antibody therapeutics? Um, I don't think there's a formal database. There is a lot of uh, data in the literature uh, in terms of uh, clinical antibody, drug antibody, I'm sorry, anti-drug antibody responses, for example. Um, and that uh, it's, can get fed back into the sort of um, assay process, the preclinical assay process to help improve these assays towards a more sort of predictive um, position. I mean, the, assay, the preclinical assays just now are used, I would say, most robustly for ranking uh, relative risk against multiple variants. In terms of what we use at Abzina, we have our own um, database of known T-cell epitopes, and we plug this into our uh, proprietary uh, bioinformatics algorithm um, to, to uh, try and identify and evaluate uh, relative risk at the in silico process. But I don't think there's a, an overall database um, of immunogenicity for, for uh, uh, biologics. Okay. Um, and what do you think the most important aspects of developability assessment are? Um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot. I mean, I showed you a slide there where there's a lot of things that can be done. Um, I think I think functionality and stability are two of the key things that can be done at that early stage. Um, of course, you know, if your molecule is not functional, then there's no point in developing it. But if it's not stable, it's unlikely to be functional for very long. Uh, so for me, I'd be focusing on functionality and stability. Uh, manu other manufacturability, productivity, uh, and um, you know synthetic routes, etc., can can be managed a little bit better downstream. But up 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 front, it's good to to, to know that what we're making is stable and that it, it does what we expect it to do. And to what extent might this impact development timelines? So I mean, it really depends uh, what level of liabilities and risks have been identified. I mean, one really goes through a fairly early process, in silico process, to, to do our best to, to design out um, liabilities at that stage before we start making material. Um, but when we make material, there's things like affinity maturation that, 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 that might be introduced to, to increase the binding uh, affinity. This can take sort of three to, to five months. Um, so that's sort of real time on your development uh, plan. But overall, I would say that you know to apply a, a rigorous developability approach early on, you know, this is going to be a two to five month process. 
and you, you know there's no amount of time and money that this would save uh, downstream. So two to five months early on in the process uh, is nothing really in the context of the full uh, time frame or lifespan of the, the program. Okay. So we have time for one last question. If we didn't get to your question, we'll be sending them directly to Campbell, and he can follow up with you after this presentation. Also, just go ahead and feel free to enter your questions now, because we will, again, be passing those on. So finally, um, what innovations do you think will help bring developability forward from a predominantly later stage to an earlier stage part of the process? Um, I think there's two things, I think. Um, one is improved in silico. Uh, you know, the more we learn uh, from, from, from drugs that are going through this process and even in the clinic, the more we can feed back and sort of almost machine learn into that, uh, into those in silico uh, bioinformatics platforms. So that's one thing, and we, we're constantly doing that at Abdina. Um, the second thing is being able to do a lot of tests with uh, not very much material. So miniaturizing uh, assays and, and high throughput uh, really helps us, um, you know, ask a lot of questions uh, without spending a lot of money having to make a lot of material. So those two things have sort of improved in silico bioinformatics um, and sort of higher throughput miniaturized uh, assay systems. Okay, great. Thanks, Campbell. Good. Well, if, that, if that's all then, I mean, Thank you, everybody who's attended and listened in. Uh, there's my contact details if you want to get in touch uh, directly, uh, and please do so if you have any further questions. Uh, and thank you to the to the organizer for for arranging this for us. And as a reminder, the recorded version of this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on our website. And as a registered attendee, you'll receive a follow-up email providing you with a direct link. We look forward to having you join us at future Ask the Expert webcast. Look for those announcements in your inbox. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.